So Mark, thanks again for joining us this evening. Um, it's great, great to have you. Uh, and, and I guess just as part of your journey um, growing, growing up as a, as a youth player, uh, how did you find it first and foremost? Uh, where, where did you begin your journey? If we go right back to the beginning, uh, and what were the types of things you were doing as, as part of your, your youth development, both as an individual and in the team aspects? Um, no, well, firstly, thank you for having me. I think um, things like this, especially during these times, are, are fantastic that um, we're able to share, I guess, our experiences and keep the learning process going, even though we're not allowed really out on the pitch at the moment. Uh, but from my younger years, so I grew up in I grew up in Birong, so I went to school in Auburn. Um, started playing quite young, mainly through uh, the influence of my granddad and and my dad played as well. So I grew up sort of watching him and uh, following football through my granddad. Um, I played through Birong until I was about seven or eight. And then I went across to Melita Eagles, which was just a club. They had a club team, but they were also in the, well, the NPL. It was obviously state league back, back then, a little bit different. And um, that I stayed with them to, till the under 13. So I think it's all the language and everything is a little bit different now, but that was sort of our, um, I guess, the, the highest sort of league that we could, we could play in growing up. And um, I guess where my my story probably you know varies a, a little bit from you know a lot of Aussie boys coming through that I know and played with was um, you know I never sort of made those zone teams or uh, those state teams that existed from you know the under twelve level upwards. So look, I was very fortunate that I had a very good relationship with Melita Eagles and. And because they'd sort of looked after me from when I was about nine, nine years old. He didn't make uh, any states. That, that, that helped uh, quite a bit. So my path very much went through them. Um, I played the 13s there, the 14s, uh, 15s. When I, when I was 15, I went into the under, the under 20s, which was the reserve grade. Um, the first grade coach at the time, Tam, he, he I guess, could say gave me my first um first grade cap just before my 16th birthday and i was quite fortunate because that came in canberra i think it was against um uh, might have been belcon and blue devils i think it was and and there was one fellow there steve o'connor who was the the coach of the ais at the time um after that uh, he, he contacted Melita and I got a trial at the Institute. And that was really the first, obviously, apart from Melita Eagles, that was the first, I guess, representative team that, uh, you know, had shown any sort of interest in me. So, yeah, Miles, again, very fortunate with Melita and the way that they, they treated me and brought me up. Obviously, teams like Parramatta Power and uh, Marconi and Northern Spirit existed then uh, in the National League. Um, so I spent a year at the AIS, which for me was fantastic. Um, I guess that was a very professional setup. Uh, you know, we, we lived on campus. We trained twice a day, if not every other day. Um, they took us on tours every school holidays. Um, though my time there was a little bit turbulent, I guess, in terms of um, me adapting to, to that sort of a schedule it was obviously very different to what I had experienced. So for me to adapt to that, um, and we played against men a lot, and my way of sort of coping with, with that jump, I was always quite small, uh, was to be quite aggressive on the field. And um, in many ways that, that helped me, uh, because after nine months at AIS, I I got a move to, to Northern Spirit. Um, the youth coach there at the time brought me in and I played a game and I got sent off and uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't that happy with me. And Laurie McKinnon was the first grade coach at Northern Spirit at that time. And you know, I was, this was just before I sort of turned, I just turned 17, sorry. And um, the youth coach said, look, no, I'm not, not interested. Uh, you know, you can sort of move on. And again, that was probably that was the start of my career because Laurie stepped in and, and took me into first grade and I made my first grade debut. It was a matter of weeks later against Parramatta Power. 
Yeah, well, I mean, just in, in going back to sort of the AIS and, and your time there, and you said it was quite turbulent, it was difficult for you to adjust in the in the first instance. So what were some of the things that you had to do? What, where, where did you have to develop yourself as an individual? Now you've talked about being aggressive. Was it only being aggressive or was there also other areas of your, of your game technically that you felt that you needed to, to improve on or you already had um, so your, your strengths and you knew what those strengths were so you were continuing to develop, develop those but also the areas you really wanted to improve to ensure that you could make or bridge that gap once you were in the IS. Yeah well for me coming through from a very young age um, I would spend every day, every, every day whether I was training that night or not at the park and I was very fortunate I had someone I had my granddad who was very helpful and so from when I was very young, on a day-to-day -day basis, I was very focused on working on just your very, very basic fundamentals. I would do one touch, two touch volleys, and that was a day-to-day -day basis. And then I think going to the AIS, adapting, well, first I didn't have, I guess, that. Uh, you know, I was quite young and I'd moved out of home and you have to sort of fend for yourself. And maybe to an extent, because I hadn't sort of been in any of the the rep teams or the camps and things like that, that, that whole environment was very new to me. Um, I was, you know, now surrounded by, you know, 20 very, very good players. And um, you have to find a way then to, to be firstly a part of that team, but then obviously secondly, knowing that the AIS is still very much a development phase for myself to, I guess, find that balance. And um, I remember very early on, so sort of growing up because of the time that I spent uh, doing all the, the technical little things, um, you know, I was quite sound technically. I, I was very good with my left and right foot. Um, you know, I was fortunate that I had, I guess, good engines. I, I had a very good work rate. So they, they were sort of things that, that I developed, you know, all through my career and sort of didn't come naturally, but they weren't something I had to worry about. And um, I remember, it was, I think it was the second or third game I played at the AIS. So I'd, I'd got sent off quite early, um, something silly. Anyway, I remember Steve O'Connor pulling me aside and, and having a chat to me. And, um, you know, he was very much about if you want to step into that men's game, uh, you know, you have, you, have to, you have to have something different. Um, you know, we, he, everyone that was sort of there, had, you know, was very good technically and, um, you know, all had their own attributes. You had to find a way to, I guess, separate yourself. And, and I think in the old NSL as well, the game back then was very, very different to, to what it is now um, in terms of that physical side of things. Um, you know, it's very, it's very much, I think, I think, I feel the game is a lot more tactical now and, and it's more of a, a speed uh, based game being able to have a lot of different attributes. Whereas I think back then, if you, you could sort of get by, if you were, if you were stronger or if you're a little bit more aggressive, um, but that was the, the biggest thing for me was going from, I guess, that semi, semi pro kind of world into the professional setup of the Institute, uh, learning to just learn your body in general. You know, I had no idea. I'd just go as hard as I could, um, you know, every single day. And then, you know, especially when you're young, you can back that up. But, you know, as you go through, you have to learn, uh, I guess, the signs. And, and that was something that helped me later on in my career that I had a very good understanding of my body and, um, you know, when, when I could really push and, and when I had to, you know, look after it. And, and that taught me to look after myself properly. Yeah, absolutely. And some great insights there. And if you just look at the journey that you actually have both domestically and then uh, for the national team as well, it's, it's been a phenomenal career. Uh, you, you touched on their northern spirit uh, and obviously where football was back then. Uh, where do you see the game itself going moving forward? You've talked to the to the tactical more of the tactical side now. What are the sort of the attributes you feel that players really need to have in the modern game? Um, look, I think they the modern game now. I think you see a lot of players are very adaptable. Um, I think the game is very much about about the space, about how you manage space with and without the ball. Um, like I said, I think it's a lot quicker and, and at the very top level, you know, you see a lot more games being played. So it's very much about how players manage themselves as well. And, uh, you know, being able to go to a tournament, for example, the Olympics with the under 23s and, and be able to back up and play at a certain level, 
um, day in, day out. Um, look, I think the game is, is heading in an exciting direction. I think you see the the speed of all the leagues now. I, mean, I can remember watching um, you know, the Italian le league years and years ago and I remember my granddad saying to me, ah, it's very slow and you know, they, they like to build up and now you watch a game and you know, it, it's full on for 90 minutes. And I used to have a lot of coaches say to me years ago, you know, it's impossible to press for 90 minutes. Well, I, I don't believe, I just simply don't believe that anymore. I see teams playing now that, that press for 90 minutes, no problem. Even I think Ange is, is a massive one for that. Um, the only time I probably think that he, he might have been wrong with it was when we played in the Middle East in 44 degrees, but we still had a good crack. And um, so I think that's that's where it is. I think the game's more dynamic, generally speaking. Yeah, absolutely. And and again, if you look at where you've played, the different countries that you've actually played in uh, as well, um, having to adapt to playing in different positions, what were your experiences having to, to, one, play in different countries at different levels and then playing in different positions? Was there anything as part of your, your, your youth development that allowed you to adapt quicker or was it something that you found yourself doing as part of your ongoing journey, depending on where you ended up uh, as a player? Yeah, look, I think, I think coming through, it was one of my biggest strengths, but, but also, you know, hurt me a little bit in, in terms of the national team, because firstly, I think the fact that I was able to do a number of different positions got me into the national team when it did. But then for me to sort of nail down a starting point took quite a while because if there was an injury or something, it was sort of like, ah, oh, it's okay, Millsy can fill that spot. And then you'd come and do that job and then that player would come back and, uh, you know, you'd sort of find yourself. But um, that, that for me was my, my biggest attribute. I think I was, and I hope the coaches that I've had over the years would say that I was very coachable in the sense that uh, I was very, I, I enjoyed instruction. I enjoyed, you know, clear instructions and I enjoyed playing, um, you know, to help, to help the boy next to me and, and doing a role that would help my team. And, I think playing in a lot of countries um, obviously helps that. You, you know, I went from Japan, which was probably where I learned the most, um, you know, football-wise. Um, it was, uh, you know, it was, a, it was very tough. Um, played a lot of games. They train extremely hard. And then that's probably when I found my most success was just after that when Ange went back to Melbourne Victory and, and brought me back when I was about 25, I think. The, being in Japan made me made me very resilient as a footballer, and I think when you add the fact that uh, you know I enjoyed instruction and I enjoyed the tactical side of the game and I enjoyed learning every day, um, that that helped me uh, when I was called upon to do play different positions and and do different roles. And I always felt that um, wherever I was or or whatever coach I had, I could adjust and adapt and and I could be trusted. And, uh, you know, that was something that, that I prided myself on through the, my career that, uh, you know, if a coach turned to me and said, all right, this week you need to play right back, um, you know, that he trusted me to do that for the team. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, we, we talk to our players all the time and one of the key words that you've said there is adaptable, being brave, being resilient um, and being creative and being able to, to play in different positions just goes to show, obviously, the skill set. Uh, that, that you had as, as a player. Was there a preferred position that you actually had when you played? Yeah, yeah, there was. I, I, I enjoyed being in the middle of the park and, um, you know, that's where I sort of felt, felt most comfortable and, and I felt that I could contribute uh, the most. And obviously, you know, in the middle of the park, there's a number of different roles and uh, I sort of enjoyed, I enjoyed them all. You know, there was times in the middle where, you know, you really have to guess, dig your heels in and, and do the dirty work. And then there was times where you could be a little bit more creative and, and get yourself into the front third and, and score goals as well. And um, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed the uh, the different aspects that um, and the different challenges that I'd face as a midfielder. Um, at national team, I, I very much enjoyed playing midfield or centre-back. I, I think I just like, I enjoyed being in the middle of the park and I think I was, that's just where I was sort of most comfortable. And obviously, as you get older as well, it's harder and harder to start going into those right back <laughs> roles. So when that, when that sort of got scrapped, I was, I was quite happy with that. <laughs> with, um, so, you, I mean, you talk, that's, it, that's your sort of favoured position and, and playing in that position and the skill set that's required being in the middle of the park. 
um, where you need to position yourself. You need to be aware. Um, you need to know what's around you. What are some of the uh, types of attackers you've come up against? Who have you faced? And who's really given it, uh, uh, you a tough, tough test when you've been playing in those positions and the, the opposition that you've come up against? Yeah, I've been, again, fortunate. Obviously, you know, with the national team especially, I've faced, um, you know, a lot of very, very good players and a lot of um, big names. Uh, probably the two two games that stand out most for me in terms of, I guess, not not just because of who we're playing, but I think the, um, the, the, the type of game it was and most memorable was we played Argentina in the 2008 Olympic Games and... Um, they were just packed with stars. Um, but so they had all the Messi's, uh, Di Maria's, um, Mascherano played, but Raquelmo played. And, and for me, that was, that was a massive challenge, I think, to see the way that, that he went about his business and, and what he did uh, was, was unbelievable. And he, he stole the show that day. And we, we did go down 1-0. Um, but the other game that stands out for me was I think it was the confederations cup in 2017 um we played against chile and sanchez um now sanchez again obviously very good player but uh tends to walk around a lot and after about the first sort of 10 minutes i was honestly wondering a little bit what what the fuss was about because he wasn't really involved <laughs> at all. um but then when he when he turned it on uh, you know, I think it was about the 20 minute mark. He decided that he wanted to play, maybe because it was, I think we went up 1 0. So he decided that he wanted to play. And, and for me, that challenge that day, um, marking him was one of the most enjoyable and toughest days of football that, that I've ever had. Just on that, and, and again, I, I remember that game very, very well. And, and the type of the game you played um, individually and collectively was very aggressive as well. So the, I guess the work that you, you had to do at that national team level, firstly, as an individual, uh, understanding what your strengths were and what you were going to bring to the game as an individual. Um, but then understanding from a homework perspective who you were coming up against, well, what type of things did you do to best prepare for games at that level where you're playing against world-class players? What type of analysis on the individuals did, did you actually do um, yourself as part of the national team when you were in the national team? Yeah, well, again, I think that's, that's somewhere the game has changed a great deal as well. Uh, obviously, when I first went into the national team, I used to stick up a video for 10 minutes of I'm not really too sure what. And then by the time sort of <clears throat> to the middle and end of my career, um, you know, we used to obviously have team meetings where we would always, the meeting would always be very much set up about how we want to go about things and, and where we would break an opposition down. So we would always look at it, obviously, from a team perspective, uh, the sort of areas that we would want to get into, how we'd want to get into those areas. But then in camp, we always had um, an iPad with our individual stuff. So we used to have a common room uh, where we would have our, our coffee and our PlayStation and things like that. And so whenever, obviously, you have a lot of downtime in the national team in terms of sitting around a hotel. So you'd go in and there'd be an iPad and you'd be able to look up your direct opponent or players around you uh, from the opposition. And, and again, all players are are very different so I think we found that was a good balance for us because so myself I, I'd like to look at, at quite a bit of footage um, more so of their more recent games or um, you know how, how they how they'd been going goal scoring assisting things like that and some players just like the team stuff so that was always just made available to us and you know I'm finding that now as well going into coaching it's very much you need to find um, the best way that 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 players learn because everybody learns very differently for me it was it was very much visual and I enjoyed it um, maybe that's why I've decided to go into coaching after my playing career but but again sometimes um, you know players are different and I think that's you need to find that as, as quickly as you can I guess that balance of um, you know what helps you and and sometimes even maybe what makes things a bit tougher yeah, absolutely. And again, any obviously our players that are on this call this evening, um, still quite young and just starting to, to to understand themselves as individuals. Any recommendations you could give to them where they're currently at and their age that they're at that might assist them as individuals, uh, both on and off the field? 
yeah, I think you need to learn all aspects of the game, uh, even if you're not a player that, you know, plays in a great deal of positions. I think it's very, very important that you understand the position of the player that's that's next to you and in front of you. Um, it's it's often the little things that make the biggest difference. Um, uh, for example, if if you're a right back and uh, you have an understanding of the ten roll, um, you you know where you need to play a ball to make it most effective for that ten to be able to face forward and penetrate. For example, so I think if you have a good understanding again, of all the positions sort of around you and, um, you know, you, you've experienced that, whether it be through training or, you know, maybe in games you get shifted around. I think understanding the game and, and why things happen uh, very much helped me become the player that I, that I am. And I think that that's very important as well, that um, it's not, uh, I guess, you, you can't be singular focused on, on one position or, or one way of playing, um, you know, especially when you get older, as you come up through the ranks and start heading in that professional world, it can all change very quickly. Um, you know, you might be playing for a coach that, that likes to play a four four two and and get in behind defences, and then you know the next minute you could be playing at a, with a coach who who likes to play out from the back. So I think if you have a good understanding of the game uh, and you're able to adapt quickly, that'll be. Um, the biggest asset you can progress yeah absolutely fantastic and we've talked uh, quite a bit around the the technically and then the tactically the tactic side of the game as well how did you actually get yourself prepared mentally for games especially when you're coming up against world-class players as well by the way yeah well obviously when it was probably a lot tougher when i was younger because i used to go through a lot of scenarios um in my head uh you know good bad and otherwise i think you can't help it um you, I think for me, it, getting closer to games when I was younger was um, once I sort of, I guess, learned to understand that all the work that I needed to do was done. So I used to very, I used to enjoy training hard. Um, so even close to games, um, I, the day before, I, I, I had certain things that I like to get through. I, um, you know, I like to make sure I completed my passes. I, again, those basic things that I got through and and I found the older that I got, the more that I sort of focused on, on what we were doing and um, making sure that, you know, every day uh, you know, I was getting something out of it. It became easier leading into games. Um, obviously, when I was young as well, I was quite superstitious, which, um, you know, I you grow out of, uh, which was which was good. I think you, as you, as you go through your career, you, you start to understand better that, um, you know, you're there for a reason and uh, form for me is, is simply a state of mind. And uh, I think that was something that helped me playing in a lot of different countries. And uh, it's very important that, um, you know, mentally, mentally you're strong and you, you have a good belief in, in what you do and how you do it. And I think if you, if you have that, uh, you know, that's the, that's the very base because, leading into games you know you're, there's always going to be something that whether it's the opposition or you know maybe the weather there's always things that that are out of your control so if you're very much focused on on what you can control um a good first touch early in the game was you know i like to always keep it very very simple uh very early and i found that um you know once a game had started building building myself in was was my best way of of making sure that my form was good yeah, fantastic. So just one more question for myself and then I think we'll go to there's some really good questions that are coming up in the group chat as well is that you've talked to preparing yourself technically, <laughs> tactically, you talked about the mental side as well. Throughout your career, I'm sure there have also been setbacks. Um, with those setbacks, how did you learn to deal with those setbacks? And, and was there a sort of a framework, I guess, that you put together to support yourself to, to get one, get through them, but to come out the other end um, and still give yourself the best opportunity to perform yeah well there is there's always there's always setbacks and you know i think that's um if you're able to obviously make that a a positive and and i guess take it take it in your stride it always makes you stronger uh, you know i had a lot of setbacks i had a lot of rejection um coming through i was very fortunate i had a very um good group of people around me and i think that was very important because there's always people always have an opinion. And I think the thing with, <clears throat> with football as well is, especially, you know, in my case, and this is experience and players that I talk to and know, um, 
if you're training hard and working hard every single day, it only takes one person um, to have the right opinion of you that can change everything in football. So football is all about opinions and it doesn't mean people are right or wrong. Um, it just means that you have to be at your very best on a daily basis because when that person does turn up, <clears throat> when that person is watching, if you have a, uh, if your mentality is strong and you have a good work ethic, then, then you won't miss that opportunity. And just on the, I guess the people around me. So I had sort of two or three people that <clears throat> I would listen to who would tell me sort of good, bad or otherwise. So if I went to a trial and I didn't make it and I'd go home and I'd be like, oh, you know, that coach, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And then I'd, I'd sit down with my granddad and he'd go through it with me and he'd, I knew he'd be honest. He might say, you know what, today you didn't really have your best day. And that for me was more important that I had two or three people that I knew would be honest to me with me all the time. So I think if you surround yourself and have a good core group around you, um, that sort of keeps you on track and keeps you on task. And like I said, in football, sometimes it's only one person's opinion that can, that can set you on a new path. And um, having him and having a few other people around me sort of kept me on track, whether there were setbacks and more importantly, the good times to keep me, to keep me level and to keep me working. <clears throat> Yeah, fantastic advice. So, Phil, I think you've got a couple of questions from the group chat. Yeah, so a few have come in. Um, so, uh, Trevor asked, Mark, um, as a young player in the 2006 uh, World Cup squad, um, what was it like to be around, you know, that squad and <coughs> that time? Um, and, you know, do you think that really accelerated your learning? Um yeah, well, obviously it was a fantastic <clears throat> experience. Uh, it, it probably wasn't as a big a shock to me as it was to everyone else. Um, you know, I'd been, I'd had a decent under twenties World Cup, and uh, Goose had been in contact with me. But um, you know, I don't think anything really prepared me for walking into that that change room. Obviously, you know, the name, the 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 leg all legends of Australian football. You know, Timmy Cahill's to Vaduka's and um, it can be very intimidating and uh, you know it definitely was at first but you know that that campaign was probably like nothing I'd experienced in terms of um, the training loads that we went through so I think by day three of camp in Melbourne I was honestly I guess too tired to be in awe of who I was training with on a day-to-day -day basis so when we went to Holland, I remember we went to Holland for two weeks and uh, just being able to, you know, every day would do, pretty much every day you'd do an 11 v 11 and, and I'd have to mark the Duca and the, the, they were very good people as well as very good footballers. And I think that was the biggest thing for me. I think they made me feel welcome and put me in an environment where, uh, you know, I felt that I could learn and I could flourish and, I think you'll find that as you get older as well and the higher quality player you have around you, you know, generally speaking, 99% of the time, the best players are the best people to be around as well. You know, they, they, well, my experience was they, you know, always wanted to share that knowledge and, and help the boy next to them. Yeah, brilliant. Um, next question was from <coughs> Ethan um, and he wanted to know what, who your favourite teammate was and why? Um, favorite teammate. Um, look, I've had a lot of good teammates. Uh, when I traveled overseas, for example, to or wherever it was, or we went to Hibs and I had a had Jamie McLaren there, which was good. Um, my favorite teammate, though, probably over the time would be Reese Williams. Uh, I think Reese um, is a fantastic player. Uh, you know, he had a lot of uh, setbacks with injuries and things like that. Um, when we we're younger coming through the national team. But for me, he was he was a fantastic player and I learned a lot. I learned a lot off him. Uh, he'd experienced a lot in England at a very young age. And I think the biggest thing though for me was to see how he always came back after those setbacks. And you know, they weren't little setbacks. He he had some serious injuries and he always came back and he always found a way to <clears throat> to reinvent himself, I guess. So for me, that was that's the best teammate that I've had or, or played with. Cool. Um, and then we've got a question from Zach here. So he's asking uh, if you've got any recommendations to maximise um, 
his uh, footballing career length, such as injury prevention? Uh, yeah, in injury prevention is obviously important. I think, you know, the, the main thing growing up is that um, you, you get sleep, uh, you know, you eat well. Um, they're the main things that, that you're always able to, as I said before, just be at your very best on a daily basis because you never know who's watching and it can, um, you know, it can be the time you least expect it when that opportunity will present itself. So I think just uh, just look after yourself, prepare every day for training like you would a game. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, eating well, so your nutrition is obviously very important. Um, is there any sort of recommendations or like what did you what, what did you do to sort of eat well, as so to, so to speak? Um, I had <laughs> I had people that would look after me in that sense. I was very lucky. Um, you know, when I was growing up, my my mum and my grandparents, uh, you know, were sort of all over that and. Um, <laughs> I think growing up, I had a good balance, which is important, uh, different things. Obviously, I fell into a little bit of a pattern as I got a little bit older, things I like to eat before the game, after the game and things like that. And then when I got married, I was very fortunate that my wife was very health conscious and um, I enjoy a lot of salads and, and vegetables. And, and I think the, 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 that's important as well. I took a lot of <clears throat> good habits from, you know, players like, Vinnie Grello and uh, Marco Bresciano and Mark Schwarzer. And I think that's, uh, you know, when you get put in those environments and you have, uh, you know, good players around, I think to take that information, that's, you know, probably where some of my best learning was done, obviously, with good habits on and off the field. Um, and then just a question uh, that which relates to the conversation we had before we started. Um, was just You mentioned about um, Hanoi. Uh, obviously, the Socceroos just had that game in Vietnam, Hanoi being a difficult place to play. Obviously, you've played a few different countries. Um, what's the most difficult place you think you've played and why? Um, look, everywhere was, was difficult for different reasons. Uh, Japan was difficult because of the, I guess, demand physically that it put on me. Um, the UAE was difficult because of the weather and you don't play in... I was very much, I'd, when I went to the UAE, I'd, I'd gone from Melbourne Victory where we were sort of playing in front of 30,000 people every week to go and play over there in, in front of no fans. And then, um, and then the UK was, was, was difficult because we played so many games. I think in my last year in England, <clears throat> uh, we played in the first month I was there. So it was in August. I think we played nine games and I had an international window there as well. So... I think uh, there's always different challenges and being able to ad adapt, I guess, and still get the best out of yourself. It was most important. Nice. Mark, just, just yeah, yeah. So just because uh, there's some great questions there and some absolutely um, brilliant answers in terms of them being uh, what, what you've done, etc. If you was to take yourself through a routine and what, what's coming out from me is, is that certainly to the question, the answers, that you've given to those questions is is that potentially rest and recovery is just as important as working hard on the field and, and to best prepare yourself for match day so what does a what did a daily routine look for you um was it the same when you were playing domestic football versus national team football did you have your your own routine that you went through uh, to best prepare yourself look, looking at all those different elements um yeah uh Club football to national football is very different uh, in terms of the way that I'd prepare. Um, obviously, club football, you spend a lot of time at home in the lead up. And, you know, it took me, <clears throat> I guess, a while to sort of find the best balance. Um, and it depends where you're playing as well. So in Australia, we would play mostly night games. So I always found on game day, um, I'd, I'd get up quite early. Uh, I'd have breakfast. I like to stay active in the morning. <clears throat> uh, often I'd take the dog for a walk or pot around in my garden because uh, you're sort of not playing till 7, 7.30 at night. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd always have a little lay down or something during the day. But again, it's more just routine and habit. Uh, I think the most important time for me was probably the, the 48 hours after a game. 
Um, I was very strict in sort of what I'd do after a game. Often I find it hard to sleep after a game. I'd continue to play the match and things like that. But as long as I sort of got my rest and recovery in that next sort of 48 hour period, I knew that leading into the next game, uh, you know, I, I, I could be at my very best. National team was probably more like uh, playing in Europe because you play so often, but you also spend a lot of time on the road and in hotels and things like that. So I think uh, preparing in national team was a little bit different. You'd have to <clears throat> keep your mind occupied in, in a lot of different ways. And that's why these, these iPads in the, in our social room and things came in very handy. Um, I, I didn't always love watching football. Uh, that was something that sort of came as I got a, got a little bit older. So when I was in camp and in Europe, uh, you know, I'd, I'd watch a lot of football and that was a good way of relaxing. And, you know, it's been funny since I, since I've retired, um, you know, I've been, my missus, my wife thinks she's married to a different man because I'm a lot more relaxed and <laughs> a lot happier and <laughs> she's starting to understand, uh, you know, the sacrifices, I guess, that I had to make, you know, even, you know, with her, like when I, when I'd had a tough day or a hard week that, you know, I wasn't just sitting on the couch to, to upset her. Um, you know, I was actually <laughs> just 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 trying to get my body ready. Because like I said, for me, I used to pride myself on, you know, being available for every session and being able to complete it. And um, But yeah, like I said, I think from a recovery point of view, the 48 hours after a match was most important for me. And in the lead up, especially when you play later games, um, you know, I, I just like to stay to stay a little bit active. Fantastic. Andrew, you have a question for Mark? Yeah, just one. Just uh, one that's probably relevant to the players that we have. When you mentioned you missed the state teams when you were younger, um, given that some of these players will make state teams and, and some won't, how did that affect you and how did you deal with it? I mean, obviously, it didn't hinder your career, but at the time, what, what did you go through and, and how did you handle it? Yeah, look, it wasn't always easy because even at Melita coming through, you know, we'd have sort of four or five boys every year from 13s, 14s that would make the, I'm not sure exactly how it works now, that would make the zone teams and go on to make state teams and things like that. And um, I guess, you know, I think because I had good people around me that sort of kept me focused, I guess, and uh, I think just having a good work ethic and, and, and belief in myself um, really, really helped. I think, uh, I guess I knew that if I kept doing what I was doing and kept working, working hard that, you know, an opportunity would eventually present itself, which it did. And thankfully I was, um, you know, I was good enough that day to, to take that opportunity. So I think that's the biggest message. I think, like I said, there's so many football and, you know, there is no right or wrong. And, and sometimes, it just takes, you know, that, that one person to see something in you that possibly the person the day before didn't. So just work hard, um, focus on what you can control. And again, I know that's, that's easy to say, hard to do, but I think as you, as you go through your journey, um, you know, you'll find, you'll find your way of doing that. Right. This is a, a, obviously a, a quote from yourself here and, and for the, the players themselves, how, how can they stay grounded and honest with themselves and, and, and hold themselves accountable? What advice could you give them there? Uh, just just challenge yourself every day. Um, you know, I've been the best players that I know <clears throat> who have gone the furthest and done the most were, were very, very focused on being better every day and, and continuing to learn. Um, take everything in. Take everybody's opinion, good, bad or otherwise, because there's always something you can get from it. Um, for example, heading into heading into my coaching career, the the way that I want to coach, I've probably taken more from coaches that I didn't like, um, as much as I've taken from from coaches coming through that I did like. So, look, everyone's opinion is valid, and I think it's just important that you you take from that what you what you need. You take from that what you think will be what make you better. I think <clears throat> criticism is always is always good. I think you need to as a footballer. Um, I guess you need to understand what to take in and what to let go. And, uh, you know, I don't believe, you know, I don't believe you don't take things too personal. Cause like I said, football has so many different opinions. Um, just continue to learn and continue to challenge yourself every day, whether that's on your own or with the team, 
keep doing things, keep putting yourself in situations that you're not comfortable with. Uh, Cause for me, it's the only way that you can grow. Fantastic. What are the key ingredients do you think to transitioning from youth football into senior football in your opinion? Um, yeah, look, it's, it's never easy. I think you have to go into it <clears throat> again, knowing that you deserve that opportunity. And I think there's, you know, obviously there's a, there's a fine line as well, but um, you know, when I was coming through the way that the best way to earn, I guess, the respect of, of the players that have been there and done that is, is to just put your head down and, and do your business. Um, you know, it's, I still feel like it's very much uh, an apprenticeship, like, like anything. Um, again, I think that coming through in football now is very different to when I came through. Um, you know, I, I, very had, I very much had to earn my stripes physically before I'd be accepted as a footballer. I think now I very much look at players, even at MacArthur that we have and judge them on, uh, you know, very much on what they do on the field. And I think it's very important that, that you're, you're, you're coachable, uh, you have a good understanding and you want to learn. And for me, that stands out the most um, now. You can tell the players that have a lot of ability, but are not so keen maybe on the learning aspect. I uh, just very much want to continue doing what they're doing. And then the players that have a lot of ability and are very keen on learning. And I think that that for me is what shines the, you know, stands out the most and, and you can pick up. And I think uh, a good attitude and that willingness to learn uh, coming into senior football and especially with senior players and coaches is, is one of the first things that's picked up on. Yeah, fantastic. And we, we hear it a lot as well, is that when we're looking at players that do have potential um, and, and they're starting to show signs that they can move on to the next level, it's still about their character as well and, and how they come across, how they interact, how they engage within sessions uh, and then both on, on and off the field as well. So you've answered, my, you've answered my next question, I guess, already on that one. Yeah, I think that, that's that's um, <clears throat> that's something now is 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 massive in football. You know the the character of the player and and how they'll fit into a change room and um, you know whether they'll add to it or they'll disrupt it. I think is is nearly as important as as the individual's ability. So just on that then, and then and then moving through, how much development is done in team training, and how much is done alone or, and or independently, or, or is there a balance between the two? And if so, what is it? Um, yeah, I think a lot now, uh, again, I can only sort of speak about the way that, um, you know, I've, I've trained over the last few years with, and again, it depends on the coach, um, you know, now the way that I like to teach and, and coach players is very much in, in that team environment. Um, we, we like to set goals, um, for, for individual players. And I think it's important when we sit down with them that we get their perspective as well. Uh, just because I think maybe there's an area they need to work on might not necessarily line up. And I think you need to find that common ground. And I think team training is, is very, very important. As I said, if you're able to, to learn the, the roles and the attributes of players around you, uh, that, that can only make you a better player. Um, throughout my career, uh, you know, my focus was always on the very, very basic, simple things. <clears throat> I knew that, if I kept that up and I didn't always get that with team training, that was something that sometimes I had to do on my own, whether, you know, it was 10 minutes with the national team after training or, you know, at home when I was a bit younger as well. I think those fundamentals, uh, you know, will, will, will never change. Uh, you know, those five yard passes, those first touch, that left and right foot. I think if you have that base and that core, that's the only way you, you, you can progress. We, we talk to the to the four corner model quite a lot, the technical, tactical, physical, and the, the psych, social side of things as well. Um, is this something that you've done both as a player and now transitioning into a coach? You've touched on it there that you, you're working more with individuals. Is it something you did as a player as well? Yeah, it was something that we did, that I did as a player. Obviously, <clears throat> we didn't have, I guess, this sort of structure and information coming through. Um, I guess it was more, it wasn't as, as specific. It was sort of left up to you to sort of uh, figure out on your own. Um, you know, over the last few years, this four corner model has been something that, uh, you know, I've looked into both, you know, for myself later on in the career and, and very much so going into coaching. And I think it's a very good way to, to be able to evaluate, evaluate yourself as well. And it's a, it's a very handy tool. And um, like I said, there's a, there's a lot of things in football now that, uh, 
you know, are utilised. And one of the biggest points that we make to our players now is that, um, you know, we're, we're very open. We, we have access to all of this. Um, players, I think, need to feel free to, to come and ask for things as well. Like I said, we might, we miss things as well. And I think if you have a good understanding of yourself and what you need, it's important that you, you speak up and you speak up early because the earlier that you can fix any sort of problem, uh, whether it falls under, you know, your technical, tactical, or um, the social, I think the sooner it's brought to attention, the, the, the better it is, the better it'll be for you. And ultimately the better it'll be for the team. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. So if you were to actually go back and talk to a 15-year-old Mark Milligan, what bits of advice would you give um, from, from your experiences now and where you're at currently? Um, I, I think the biggest thing for me, I'd, I'd tell myself, would be to be patient. Um, I don't think, uh, not, that I, not that I got ahead of myself or, or rushed anything like that. I think just you know, sort of from that 15 on, that's when sort of things started to happen. And I think uh, if I was a little bit more patient and, and I think trusted myself a little bit more, um, you know, things might have been a little bit different. And by no means do I want anything in my career to, to change. But I think, um, I think just to, just to be patient and, 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 and I guess think, think about things and, and make sure I was making the, the right decision, uh, you know, long term. I think it, it's good to have a picture of where you want to be in a couple of years' time, especially when you sort of get to that 15, 16, 17 years old. Um, so that'd probably be the main thing I'd, I'd tell my, myself, just just to be patient, um, keep working hard. Mark, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, so many great things to take away, not just for the players, I'm sure, but, but us as coaches as well. Um, I wish you all the best of luck transitioning into your coaching career um, and a successful see upcoming season as well. Uh, from behalf of all of the TSP players, parents, uh, Phil, Andrew and Drew, uh, thank you very much and, and all the best. Take care. Thank you so much for having me.